It's time now for Empowered Family Talk with Francita Holris. Do you want to empower families and young people in your community? Then take the time to make a tax-deductible contribution to the Coach Tate Fund. The Coach Tate Foundation is dedicated to helping young people and their families in learning and passing on the kinds of life skills that we all need to succeed. All too often, we hear about kids and their families having encountered life's difficulties that could have been easily avoided by knowing better decision-making skills. From anger management to money management to something as simple as learning to manage how we spend our time or how we use our job skills. Make a donation to the Coach Tate Fund. It'll help kids who need help and their families too. Make your contribution to the Coach Tate Fund. Get details at www.coachtatefoundation.com. And oh, by the way, thank you. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts Be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Good morning. It's family time. And welcome back to Empower Family Talk right here on Praise 107.9 in the beautiful Sunshine State, Jacksonville, Florida. We the peoples hang it forward in this 21st century as we balance these scales of justice within our SSP for the PPT. Are we ready? Our guest today is ready and here to help you get ready. And we take this time to thank our Major General for his decorated and dedicated service to these United States of America. Now, I'm going to give our listeners a, a, a brief uh, Reader's Digest version of our guest today. Uh, introduction of Major General David P. Burford. He began his current joint assignment as Deputy Commander for Mobilization and Reserve Affairs with the United States Special Operations Command at McDale Air Base in the state of Florida, January of 2007. In 2009, he was uh, special assistant to the Chief National Guard Bureau at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Now, General Burford's military career began in 1973, and we're going to scale it up to September 2001, right after 9-11. Generals mobilized for the global war on terrorism as deputy commanding general of the Army Special Forces Command in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he he was second in command of the Army's 9,000-man infantry of Green Beret soldiers, which consisted of five active-duty Special Forces groups. And as today, his civilian occupation, he recently retired as manager of the Nuclear Fleet Security for Southern Nuclear Operating Company in Birmingham, Alabama, Southern Company's Nuclear Electric Utility subsidiary. Today, he works with nonprofit organizations that support veterans. He's the executive committee of the Central Alabama Veterans Committee chairmanship of several others. His education, and we'll get right to the general, he's uh, 1973, the Georgia Institute of Technology with a degree in chemical engineering, 1997, United States Army War College, 2005, Harvard University School of Government, National and International Security in Boston, Massachusetts, 2010, George Washington University. Boy, thank you, General, for all you do for the United States, and certainly welcome back to Empower Family Talk. Well, it's my pleasure. Good to hear from you again, Francina. It's good to have you here, General, and, you know, we always come together, it seems, at a time of crisis in our nation, and uh, with all that's going on with cybersecurity, the the pandemic, COV-19, and now we have the Cyber 2020, can you just share 
with our listeners what some of our vulnerabilities, the opportunities, and the challenges might be for our families today? Well, some have waned and some have grown, as you, we probably all know. Social distancing is a very difficult thing for us to do. As humans, we tend to want to gather together, whether it's socially or professionally, go places, see things, share experiences with others, and now we're just not able to do that if you adhere to the rules that most states have implemented. Uh, likewise, even wearing a mask is a social distance because you can't see the expression on people's faces. It's kind of troubling, frankly. What that has done, though, as people have moved away from congregating events to separate events, it's turned a reliance almost entirely on Internet communications and Internet activities. Even today, this radio broadcast is going on in three different locations that come together to one stream at some point in the future. So that obviously yeah. creates a strain on the Internet and the, what we call the pipeline or the size of the pipelines that you have in and out of your home and in and out of businesses and, of course, the national infrastructure of cyber communication. The stress there makes it a vulnerability, and likewise, it makes it an opportunity for those who would use it in ways that are less scrupulous, uh, whether that's trying to scam you out of a home payment or make you think you owe the IRS money and send somebody a check. Or in my case, I was impersonated a couple of years ago on the Internet, and people tried to dig into my accounts. So while we rely on it, we have to be constantly vigilant of the dangers that entails. Right. Right, and that's, that's one of the key things with uh, the stay-at-home orders. And uh, one of the families, we have several questions, uh, General, that came in today, but we'll have to have you back on another show. But this, this most important element is the vulnerabilities of our children on that Internet. They're, they have to do online education now. The church is online. The sports events are online. Banking. And our health care is now becoming online. You know, what say you about when that grid goes down, how our families need to be prepared with a contingency plan? Well, first of all, let's go back and talk first of the vulnerability and the danger of the Internet. Just as people have begun to turn to it to transact their business and transact their personal affairs, those with unscrupulous objectives would find it an opportunity to take things from you whether it's your money or your privacy or, or the allegiance and vulnerability of your children, they're out there lurking on the Internet looking for opportunities. So what you see on the screen and how you transmit it, whether you use secure websites, or whether your home Internet has password protection, whether you have encryption on that, is vitally important. Uh, and to be very knowledgeable in reading about what scams might look like, uh, the IRS will not call you on the phone and tell you that you owe them money. They just don't. Right. Like people do. There are shops in other countries that have a record of calls, and they call different people and try to get an extortion of funds to clear your good name, quote, unquote, or they'll send the sheriff. Uh, the most hilarious one I saw is when they called a sheriff and implied they were going to come get her. And she played <laughs> along. It was a huge, it's a great YouTube video. You need to watch it sometime. But likewise, <laughs> while we can't prevent it, you just have to be very vigilant that the opportunities have risen and vulnerability goes up because people are searching for connections. Um, children are the most vulnerable. I would say that anyone with young children does not need to give them a device that's unmonitored by parental controls. That's just a bad idea. Children are curious, and that curiosity leads them astray in so many ways by those who offer opportunities that are just completely unsavory. And, and that brings in your human trafficking and child trafficking that so it permeates our society from you know high levels of society down to our lower levels of society. Uh, how can we prevent, if we can, if it's possible, uh, the or track the tracking of humans and children from the internet? That's such a vulnerability for our families, especially today in COVID. Yeah, this, you're, you're right, and I think the uh, federal law enforcement uh, efforts have been directed toward the Internet in defense of children and traffic and email communications that might be setting up a meet or a buy or a trip that's probably not appropriate for a child to be agreeing to. Uh, children are vulnerable because of their lack of experience. It's not ignorance. It's just lack of experience. And they're 
energized by excitement. And those who would troll the Internet for them know that. Uh, they've had many successes and some failures and have learned from that of what children are attracted to and offer that up as a bright, shiny object that the child even initially might just play along with but eventually embraces that change and excitement. And maybe it's an opportunity uh, to do something sneaky or something their parents might not know about. We all know is that temptation was for us as children as well. Uh, tell your right. mom you're going to one place and go to another. I think we've probably all done that. Well, the Internet opens a whole new vista of danger for that. Yes, yes. And that's, that worries me so much, as you know, as you well know, is to, I don't think we can prevent it. It's just getting prepared and getting ready and recognizing the signs. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, we've had hackers with our celebrities on, on Twitter recently, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of things being deployed on the grid, as we know with Stutnet. Uh, that's affecting our workplaces, how we transact business, uh, how we uh, interconnect with each other with foreign countries. And that's a whole other subject. But one of the key questions that hit the table, uh, General, is what, do you, what role do you believe mental health plays in our SSP, the new order for our SSP, for the PPT, especially for our veterans? Uh, I think it's is a population of those who have a, a different vulnerability, and it certainly is out there. I'd make a, a couple of points in going back to things we talked about a minute ago. Uh, one of the issues for use of the Internet is the fact that some people, at least as old as me, are not as proficient on the Internet as their children are. And you need to have unalienable rights to dig into whatever they're doing on their computer and read their emails and read their text messages until they come of legal age. That's your responsibility. Whether you like it or not, whether they like it or not, but they certainly won't, you have to invade that privacy to protect them. And being their friend is different from being their parent. Being their parent is a much tougher job. That's right. That's right. And and we, we want you want to get back to what we were saying earlier about the workplace, that net, and uh, some of that unseen, just like well, COVID. Uh, I would say that... Those with uh, strategic criminal intent, those that want to affect the direction of nations or directions of funding, uh, tend to use the Internet as a scenario backdrop. And they paint a scenario backdrop that they want you to see that the the price of gold is, is going up, so you need to buy it. And that's probably not true, but they put it out there in such convincing fashion, and people pass it along on the Internet, and it becomes pseudo knowledge. It's not true, but a lot of people have read it, and therefore they assume it's true. In in my own research on the Internet, I pull on as many resources as I can and then compare the results. And 99 times out of 100, those results differ depending on who explains something to you. But your tool is to look at a lot of outlets and find out what the truth might be because it's usually right down the middle of the road of the different writings of different uh, authors on the Internet. And sometimes it's not. I would say that other foreign actors have attempted to influence the thinking in this country by throwing out information that's completely fabricated, but they throw it out in five different locations and ask people to spread it around. So while it becomes common knowledge, it's not necessarily true knowledge. Mm. And that's where the kids and families and even uh, regular citizens have to have that sixth sense that we talk about. Uh, because we know what happened with Stutnet, you know, it was that uh, worm on the grid that nobody could sense, but it was there, right. causing damage. Right. And and so we have to somehow begin to, uh, just like COVID-19, is something that we cannot see that has literally shut down life as we've known it, gentlemen. Uh, I think you're right. So, uh, I think uh, what what at least it works for me, and I'm not sure it works for everybody, is to listen to that inner voice that you have, that gut feeling, this doesn't sound right or this doesn't feel right. Something that's underpriced from what you expect it to be may not be a valid sale. It may just be a a false flag to try to get you to send money somewhere. And what that does is, frankly, it takes us back to individual values. You can detect when something's wrong when you have strong values yourself. Strong values you're not born with, you're taught. And your parents and your nuclear family are what reinforces those values for you. That's where they come from. But right. that inner voice, 
It's very helpful. Yes, and I think we're going to have to learn and teach uh, with uh, uh, legendary such as yourself and others uh, to how to transfer that knowledge and actually teach, because I think that sixth sense, of, our sixth of purpose, like what happened in Boston with the bomber there, he didn't sense yes. it. It was there. So you I know, think we have a learning curve to, to, to yeah. teach how to uh, utilize that, that unseen gift that we all have. Would you it, agree? It is, and uh, I do. Unfortunately, we have in the past had a very trusting society. We trusted one another. You know, people right. at intersections would honor the red light in their direction so you could cross safely. People who were putting down a backpack did so because their shoulder was tired, no other reason. And we're gradually assuming a bit more paranoia because enemies of, of us have taken advantage of the fact that we are an open people and very trusting. Right. And it is unfortunate, but I think it's going to continue, and it may even accelerate as we see more people take the opportunity to hurt us in some way. Right, and especially what's going on today. I mean, you you look at Congress, you look at, you know, the White House and our leaders and what we're faced with with our economy and the racial tensions in our communities and the the communication uh, on that Internet that's allowed to spread hate and race, baby, fighting, burning down statues. How do we have a new plan to go forward to create a better society in our cyber world and in our offline world? Well, first, I think uh, that while the message is clear, the violence is unacceptable. Uh, the message is much better received if it's not accompanied or prefaced with violence or followed by violence. In fact, violence that we're seeing today probably degrades the message that we have some neat things we need to change, and we do. But what made this country great was us working together. What's make, working gonna make together. Us a, yeah, what's going to make us a third world country if we, if we don't work together anymore. We've got to get to wow. that point where we can stand together, talk, disagree, and move forward regardless. Well, that's, that, that's very key. And I am uh, a part of the solution. We want to be part of the solution. The, the hackers and all the things that we know about and some that we don't know about uh, are, are, are existing. So we have to create solutions instead of constantly hopping on the problem. One more thing. I want to get back to that mental health question. Mm-hmm. Uh, what role do you think that mental health plays, especially for our veterans, in the safety, security? As, as you know, in nuclear security, you were my great mentor when I first came into the Southern Company in Alabama, and it's it's a it's an interesting time that we're in when you're looking at gun violence and safety mm-hmm. and security, and the mindset we've always been a big proponent of is not the weapon, it's not the tools, it's the mindset behind that tool. And when we see this occurring in our workplaces, in our government, and in our communities. How can we prepare to do better today for our tomorrows? Well, for, for reasons I'm probably not qualified to explain, we're leaning toward more violent solutions to domestic differences of opinion, and that's unacceptable. Now, where that has its roots, I guess, is in the falling value of the results of a violent act. That may be because mm-hmm. of Internet games. It may be because of childhood trauma and childhood violence, and it also has to do with what you talked about, mental capacity. Um, There are those who've been affected uh, by combat, and we need to work closely to make sure that they can survive themselves. Uh, And when I say survive themselves, I'm saying their inner process within the confines of their own head of how do they get through a day and not resort to violence or inflict violence on themselves or others around them. Uh, We don't do that very well. I think we've tried as a nation to solve that at the federal level, and that's probably not as successful, although I think the second largest budget line in the budget behind the Department of Defense is the VA. And I just, I'm not sure that that money is effectively spent. I know it's spent all over the place, but its effectiveness is probably called into question. 
And that's why in my retirement, I devote a lot of my time here at home to working with organizations that support veterans. And there's several because they have several other different, differing focuses. Some of those focuses are good for one set of people. Some are not so good for that set. You need another organization to serve the second set. Uh, but it has to be the community's got to help. The community's got to recognize the, the effect that combat has on some individuals and what it does to people. Yeah. Yeah. I experienced that in my own family. And as you know, in recruiting, you know, uh, officers for the workforce, uh, the, the personality evaluation is very big uh, and very important before you uh, deploy them out for duty and an assignment. Uh, these kids today are looking at solution-based problems for the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where I want to turn if, if we can briefly answer the questions of career pathing in cybersecurity and SSP for the PPT. What jobs should our young folks be looking for in this area to become solution workers, uh, to, to create new ways, especially on that grid, of conducting well, I, our daily lives? I think we go back to the use of the, cyber, uh, the Internet and the vulnerabilities that cyber has created. There's a world's worth of jobs in that field. And right. creativity doesn't need to be done by strong men or big individuals, anybody who can think along clearly and separate the influence from the influential somehow in a safe way, there's going to be a lot of work for that. Likewise, we're relying more on drones. I think you've got a program to support education in the drone field to not yeah. only create traffic patterns that work better, but deliver packages. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. Wow. But let me, let me go back about? to you talked about you talked about yeah, nuclear security guards. The reason you and I have that common ground is if I'm going to put a loaded weapon in the hand of someone and expect them to consider the use of deadly force on an intruder, I need to know that he makes good decisions, he or she. Yes. 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 Amen, and thank you for that. And that's where we are today with police reform. A new order for SSP, for the PPP. And and right now, all of our law enforcement, you know, nuclear security and safety, we all work together to bring about a change for the people in the communities. Now, when, when we look at uh, the, the workforce, these young college graduates are coming out now, and they're getting escalated education in cyber. And uh, we talked about drones, and then we talk about maritime. Now, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on protecting our water in maritime security? We don't talk about that very much. Uh, it, it's a very difficult thing to do. I do have a good friend who has a business in maritime security. In fact, he was the one who sent armed guards on the ship that Captain Phillips reoccupied after his rescue by the Navy SEALs. Um, mm. Ships are under attack uh, easier, mostly as a ransom item, either the crew or the cargo for money, and the vulnerability of them is that they're big, they're slow moving, and everybody knows where they are. Um, that has, I say it has decelerated somewhat, but I can't speak with any authority on that. But it's going to continue because there are those yeah. who are disadvantaged to see criminal behavior as a solution to their disadvantagement. Yes. Yeah. Especially here in Florida, at the at the Gulf mm -hmm. and the Atlantic Ocean, where the ships come in, uh, and as we learned during our nuclear protecting the nuclear plants by that large body of water, uh, the vulnerabilities that may exist uh, in in underground security uh, breaches. Uh, so yeah. there are many careers, from what I hear, and even just the three we talked about are high paying, opportunity for innovation for entrepreneurs to enter into the supply chain to enter into the workforce to create these new solutions. Do you see that going forward in general? I, I do, and I would say that all three of those share a common requirement, and that is that you need people who know how to do the right thing. And doing the right thing comes from the time that they can understand the spoken word. When you start to train them, don't put your hand on the stove, don't ride your bicycle without a helmet, and you begin to understand that people are trying to preserve you 
by giving you a direction. And that direction then results in your ability to make good choices for yourself and eventually make good choices for others. Exactly. Uh, General, I certainly uh, uh, value all that you bring to the table with your background. You have a way, uh, as the Bible says, Jesus, when he taught, he said it should be simple where a child can understand it. And our next generation is at a very critical point today in our workforce, our security force, our protection. And we have to get about the strategic education so that our economic security can be on a forward path. Is that something that you would agree with in closing, that uh, we need to realize the economic impact, not taking solution-based action to move forward can hinder us? And I would, I would further reinforce what you said. I think we're at a turning point. We need to ask ourselves, where does this generation need to be in five years? And what do they yeah. need to look like as adults? And I'm not sure we've asked that question enough. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, uh, uh, General, I'd like for you, if you could, and, and certainly we at the Coach Tate Foundation certainly appreciate all of your support. For, for this platform and uh, the goals that we have going forward to actually lead by example and begin to embrace our young folks for this new next generation of safety, security, and protection for our people, places, and things. Now, General, we've run out of time. Doesn't it go fast when you're talking about a, a, a VIP subject like this? It does, but I'd be glad to come back and continue on or reinforce what we talked about. It's your pleasure. Oh, that would be awesome. I know our listeners uh, have taken some copious notes. And just to hear from you again, as you've been with us before, uh, because we're at a critical time in our society. Now, could you share uh, your closing, your final closing remarks with our listeners on where we are today and, and give us some encouragement for our tomorrow if we take the right steps today? Uh, I guess what's encouraging is I do see people making the right choices. What I find discouraging is sometimes they're attacked for that. And there is an element in our society that embraces lawlessness, and it must be brought to heal because it's not going to allow the rest of us to live and prosper. Amen. Amen. Thank you, General. Thank you so much for your time today, being with us, and most of all for your most notable decorated and dedicated service to our country and our citizens. So thank you again, and, uh, and to all of our listeners, it's family time. It's time to get our SSP for the PPP in order. We must be good stewards of what our Heavenly Father has blessed us with. Until next week, same time, same station, praise, 107 107- Point nine, Jacksonville, Florida. I am Francina Tate Holrest, your hostess. Empower your family with the dynamic new book by Francina Holrest, Our Sixth Sense and Purpose, The Power in Knowing Who You Are. It's the book that gives you insights into life's problems. Francina Halrus is an author, motivational speaker, and national broadcaster who believes the answers to your problems lies within the knowledge that was once traditionally passed down by families. But that knowledge has been short-circuited by today's faster pace. The book, Our Sixth Sense and Purpose, The Power in Knowing Who You Are, brings that accumulated wisdom to the problems that all families face. You'll find your copy of our sixth sense and purpose, the power in knowing who you are at Amazon and at better bookstores. Empower your life with the dynamic new book, Our Sixth Sense and Purpose, The Power in Knowing Who You Are by Francina Hallress. Thank you for joining Francina Hallress on Empowered Family Talk. Tune in next week. 